Gestapo, toilets, and Trump coups? The breakdown starts now. Good evening and welcome to The Breakdown. I'm Tara Setmayer. This is The Rick Wilson. And we've got a great show for you tonight. It's been a really weird um, Trump news day. Uh, just the whole week has just been really odd. The fact that we're talking about Trump and toilets in the same sentence, I guess, is apropos. But there's been a lot happening. Um, we've got a great guest for you tonight. We have a legal scholar, Matthew Seligman, who's going to talk about the um, possible worst case scenarios in 2024 if we don't do something about this Electoral Count Act. Like, what could happen? Could there actually be a Trump coup if he ran and, God forbid, lost and won or whatever? What kind of scenarios would happen? So stay tuned for that because as if we don't scare the bejesus out of you guys, uh, a lot of shows about all the nightmare scenarios, we might actually find a solution to how to stop this tonight too. So stay tuned for Matthew. And we also have another sneak peek of a really good funny LP ad. Rick and his crew, uh, the geniuses that they are, it's funny. So stay tuned for that. It'll be at the end of the show. Um, Rick, before we get to all of that, we got a couple of headlines. Um, <laughs> nice shirt, by the way. Um, you're muted. For God's sakes, Wilson, you're muted. Okay. While he figures that How out. How can I be <laughs> muted when I'm, when I'm yelling, yelling like a, like a maniac? Um, <laughs> Yes, and in answer to a question I've already received, available at the Lincoln Project Gear Store, lincolnproject.us slash gear. Yes, we still have those, and we have some other cool gear things, too. And, and new stuff um, coming for the hilarious new season of the, yes. of, the, of, the, of the festivities we refer to as Hell in American Politics. Oh, my goodness gracious. And um, we asked folks to send us their favorite band books. And if we selected your tweet, you will get some Lincoln Project swag. So there's that, too. But before we actually get into headlines, Rick, um, I want to continue with our Black History Month moment that we've been doing now yes. uh, with each show for Black History and really highlighting the more um, obscure Black historians that people just don't know about, the Black historical figures. Mm -hmm. And today I wanted to bring up um, Thomas Jennings, which I didn't know about him. I learned something. Thomas Jennings was the first African-American to get a patent because back before then, um, I think it was in 1827, I think, um, before that, any inventions or any intellectual property was owned by the slave owners. Right. <laughs> and he was actually born free in New York City. So he applied for a patent. He got it, took a year. And um, it was John Quincy Adams who actually signed his, his patent for him. <laughs> and guess what he was able to invent? Dry cleaning. He is the God one who we can God thank bless him. America. God bless him. That's right. He, he called it, it was called something else, dry scrubbing. Mm -hmm. He took an apprenticeship, learned um, how to become a tailor, worked in a tailor shop, made lots of money, and came up with this, what we now know as dry cleaning. So good for him. And he used some of his fortune to help fund abolitionist um, causes. So thank you, Mr. Jennings and your family, um, for creating dry cleaning for us. And uh, that's wonderful. So that's our it's Black the History little moment. little things, you know? <laughs> yes. You take it for granted. I mean, yeah, I also believe it was a Black man who created air conditioning, invented air conditioning. But anyway, um, all right, headlines. So <laughs> where do you want to start, Rick? Do you want to start with the <clears throat> gazpacho police or do you want to start with toilets? I think we should start with gazpacho. You know what, hey, folks? There are times when the absurdity of our of our <laughs> opponents in this process rears its beautiful golden mane and says something so unbelievably dumb that it's really one of those moments where where you remember the magic of social media and not just the misery where where the jokes come fast furious and and just absolutely perfectly encapsulate the absurdity of the the right wing bullshit machine on the other side because so let's let's set it up, Rick. Let's set, set it, it up because some, cause some yeah. people may not know what the hell we're talking about. I personally, I'm a fan of gazpacho. Yes, the cold tomato soup. If it's made well, it's delish. However, when in a 
dumbass like Marjorie Taylor Greene mixes up Gestapo and Gazpacho, it is a glorious piece of nonsense that warrants the international ridicule that it got. If you don't know what we're talking about, take a look. Not only do we have the D.C. jail, which is the D.C. gulag, but now we have Nancy Pelosi's gazpacho police spying on members of Congress, spying on the legislative work that we do, spying on our staff, and spying on American citizens that want to come talk to their rep- <laughs> Shout out to Kate uh, for this gazpacho, gazpacho special victims unit. No, but I mean, look. First off, I, w- I want to say something about a more, slightly more serious. What you see her doing is part of a broader movement right now on the right in the Republican Party to try to turn the criminals, the violent mob that tried to overthrow a, vi- a, a fair and free democratic election in this country, they tried to overturn it by attacking the Capitol, attacking police officers, at the, uh, both Capitol Police and D.C. Metro Police, who tried to defend the sacred temple of our democracy. Mm -hmm. And now they're trying to turn those people into either victims or heroes. So when she compares the DC jail to the gulag, now look, as a guy who's one of the last young coal warriors way back in the 1980s, I can tell you there is no comparison to a forced Soviet slave labor camp in miserable places like Siberia to a jail you may not like being there, but chances are you did something to put you there. Um, also, just as an aside, Rick, mm-hmm. my husband's first job in law enforcement right? was as a correctional officer at the D.C. jail. I assure you, it's, it's not, not the a gulag. gulag. Carry yeah. on. So, uh, but but then she frames this and now says, oh, they're spying on members of the of Congress. You know what, Nance? Or, you know what, um, you, you know what, Marge? If you stop giving tours to people trying to overthrow <laughs> the goddamn United States government, you know, call me crazy. We wouldn't have to have this enhanced security presence in the Capitol. You brought it there. Your friends brought it there. Your scumbag buddies who wanted to overthrow the government, who brought the Confederate flag into the Capitol rotunda, who, who took craps in the U.S. Capitol on the floor, who, who, who vandalized the Capitol, who broke into offices, who had a violent plan to overthrow the election. You, 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 you worry about the police being, a, a Capitol Police having to, to, to look out for things? Well, that's why. It's on that's you, right. Marge. You and your little pals. So, and, and clearly they've banned, it uh, looks like there's already been a book ban uh, in her district. Gazpacho and Gestapo, she can't even get her, her references right. Right, such and, a and, dumbass. and, and let's, let's be honest here. Um, on most days, on 99% of the days of, of, of all time, 99.999% of the days of all time, the Capitol is a place where people come with respect and dignity, mm-hmm. and the police there have an important and serious job, but they rarely face the kind of, of chaotic violence of that day. Well, never. Uh, never that level. Them, yeah, cr- indeed. Indeed. <laughs> comparing them to the Gestapo, what an the insult German to them. secret police dedicated to the routing out of the Jews and political enemies of the regime is an obscenity. It That's is right. an obscenity. And, and this is, of course, part of the, the, the culture of either ignorance or transgression, or maybe their ignorance and their transgressiveness got together, hooked up, and had a baby, because <laughs> this is the kind of thing that you would never say if you had a, you would never call it a gulag, and you would never compare the Capitol Police to the Gestapo if you had the slightest historical context. But Marjorie Taylor Greene's historical context apparently stops and starts with, with her CrossFit. I mean, yeah. that woman is dumber than a sack of hair. I'm telling you. And um, that is not backing the blue. So Republicans uh-uh. need to cut the shit. Where, where are all the Republicans who claim right. that they're so, you know, that they support the, the, our police officers and they report our, support law enforcement when she's now comparing them to the Gestapo? Yeah, where, where, it, where the hell are they now? And of it's, course, because Kevin McCarthy um, has testicles that cannot be detected with any scientific instrument. Um, including the the most sensitive nanoscale electronic scanning microscopes, um, he won't say, Marge, shut the hell up. Yeah, he's scared of her. He's scared, he's scared of, her. of her. How many times he's he knows terrified that. of her. He knows he's that. He's terrified of all of the of of the up and coming scumbag caucus that he knows are going to 
are going to pose an immediate challenge. Look, Matt Gates is laying it out there in these cryptic tweets about the 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 the, the young leopard taking over the pack. Go, Matt. Just declare. Just say you're running against him. Right. He's going to have if enough competition as it is. <laughs> or Matt, Matt will be running for the for the uh, speaker of cell block Q. Yeah, next to Jim Jordan, maybe. Um, so <laughs> we're going to have to come up with another scary scenario of who might be the speaker because it's sure, certainly not going to be Kevin McCarthy. Kevin McCarthy. He's never going to be speaker. We continue to say this and we stand by it. Um, before we bring in Matt, um, this McConnell-Trump war, we have been on the forefront of this and it's now really- You're reached. welcome, America. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, we have been talking about this and pointing this out for months, and this is just the beginning. We have Trump sending out um, uh, statements calling Trump and uh, calling McConnell an old crow. He's pissed off because McConnell came out and was like, "Yeah, it wasn't a uh, legitimate political discourse. No one is the RNC shouldn't be condemning members of Congress." He's right. like, you know, he spoke out about it and against Trump, and so now Trump is on the war path with McConnell and. DeSantis is in the middle of this. We talked about it on Tuesday. DeSantis is also not condemning neo-Nazis. And all of a sudden, apparently now, he's a N-word apologist because he thinks that Joe Rogan shouldn't have apologized for that. He should, he should, you know, to hell with the with the cancel culture mob. I'm sorry, the guy said the freaking N-word over a hundred times on the show. He needs to fucking apologize. What is what is happening? Yeah, well, look, Ron DeSantis <laughs> is part of a political culture now on the right that believes that any example of shame or regret or, or, or any kind of apology for anything represents a fatal compromise with big lib or, or this sort of overculture that, that they believe must be defeated and crushed. So basically, Ron DeSantis has now come out and said, you know, Joe Rogan's fine. He shouldn't apologize for, for saying the N-word hundreds of times. That, that's today's GOP, oh, folks. Go with that one, Ron. Yeah, yeah. Go run on that one. platform. Good grief. Um, well, on that note, let's bring in tonight's guest. Let's talk a little uh, coups and Trump and electoral count stuff. <laughs> tonight's guest is legal scholar and fellow at Yale Law School, Matthew Seligman. Hey, um, Matt. The, the, the New York Times calls you the uh, Mr. Worst Case Scenario. Um, yes. I don't know if that's a moniker that you're proud of or what, but Nick we're going to find- I'm very, very proud. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to find out why. Maybe it's because you wrote uh, this, this paper uh, called A Realistic Risk Assessment of the Presidential Election of 2024. We're going to get to all that in a second. But I wanted to ask you, since it's the big news, today about Donald Trump potentially flushing documents down the toilet. It's being reported um, coming out of Maggie Haberman's upcoming book. This ties into this whole notion that Donald Trump didn't care about the Presidential Records Act, doesn't care about what the law is to preserve documents. This is just one of a series of reports about him destroying federal documents. Is, is this prosecutable? It might be. And there are criminal uh, penalties that attach to violations of this. It would be rare, but we haven't seen situations that are quite this extreme either. So uh, as in so many respects during the, pre the Trump presidency, we're in uncharted territory. Sure. Uh, unflushed territory, apparently. Uh, <laughs> let's, 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 do you have a question, Rick, before yeah, we talk I, about I did. I did okay. Thanks again for joining us. One of the things I'm curious about is, you know, you sort of, by worst casing this, um, in, in a lot of ways, you know, is it, are you seeing any signs that any of the sort of norms and institutions that were, that are supposed to be wired into our system actually understand how bad it can get and how quickly it can go bad? I mean, I, I don't see it, but I, maybe you have a deeper study of it, but the, the way I look at it is everyone's sort of shrugging and saying, yeah, whatever happens, we'll be okay. And I, I don't think we will be okay. I think that people need to be much more worried than they currently are, but I'm, even though I'm a worst case scenario kind of guy, I'm also an optimist. And I think that the quick movement that we've seen uh, in the bipartisan group of senators where on a dime after the voting rights legislation uh, failed, there was a quick pivot to moving on the issue that actually arose in 2020 and 2021. And, you know, we have Senator Manchin saying that absolutely it's going to pass. You know, Senator McConnell, whatever else you think about him, has come out in support of reforming this law. So it's, you know, I do think that the 
the catastrophic risks that face the country are starting to break through. And I think the Senate ultimately will act. Let's redefine what those what those are, because most people don't follow this as closely as we do. No one knows what the hell the Electoral Count Act of 1887 is or what the controversy is. So let's just back it up for a second. Did Mike Pence, as vice president, have any authority whatsoever under this act to overturn the certification of presidential of President Biden's uh, election win in 2020? No, he didn't. He was absolutely right to reject that power. He doesn't have it under the Electoral Count Act, and he doesn't have it under the 12th Amendment, which is the part of the Constitution that governs our Electoral College. He had that power nowhere, and no one reasonable thought that he did. So what do you say to the Peter Navarros and all the litany of of Trump uh, folks out there that claim that he did and that Mike Pence is an apostate? How dare he? Uh, What do you say to them? Because they seem to think otherwise. I mean, you're a legal scholar. (laughs) Read the Constitution. There's no reason to think that anybody ever meant to give the vice president this kind of monarchical power to install himself in power indefinitely. It's an absurd po- proposition that the framers, who had just fought a revolutionary war to get rid of a monarchy, would then put in place a system where the decision about who would be president would be placed in one and only one person who had such an obvious conflict of interest. Right, right. Uh- and I do think I do think that you know obviously he went to uh, serious legal scholars like Dan Quayle for advice, but at least at the end of the day, you know he had enough folks around him who said this is a, you know there are a lot of people who believe things exist that don't. There are a lot of people who believe that that you know uh, when you've got a company that 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 the founder runs it, not the board, or the management committee runs it, not the board, or all these sort of fantasy ideas that people have. Um, at least he listened at that point to counsel that said, you can't do this. And, and although it's taken him a long time to sort of, you know, get front and center and say it publicly, I'm glad he did. I'm glad he did too. And I think that the sorts of crazy legal ideas that we saw gaining more and more prominence uh, over the course of the election, they are of a piece with the factual conspiracy theories about, you know, the crazier versions are the Italian military satellites, but you know even the more sane versions right. where there are massive conspiracies of votes getting flipped, and there's absolutely no evidence of this whatsoever. Those are factual conspiracy theories, and something we've begun to see rise to prominence that I never thought possible are legal conspiracy theories. These ideas that the law says something that it just doesn't because it leads to the result that somebody wants it to. Right. And that's been the danger here, right? I, I, I would think that the... The, the, the guardrails to to Rick's point earlier, like what what do we see to kind of stop this? And we were concerned that they may not hold at least the judicial branch this time around rejected this. These notions of election fraud and some of the more cockamamie legal ideas here over 60 times. So at least there was that. Right. Um, but if there's if the president, if the vice president doesn't have that power and it's pretty clear in the Constitution under the 12th Amendment, Why is it necessary for the Electoral Count Act to be reformed? What needs to change in it so that we don't even have any ambiguity going into 2024? Uh Uh-oh, did we we lose Matthew? We lost him for a second. That's okay. Um, We'll we'll get him back. We'll get him back. But Rick, on on this You know, folks, we've only been doing this for about a year. (laughs) And, this is not on our end. And, <laughs> that was and, 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 and sometimes we have a pretty good show. Sometimes <laughs> the technology gods have, have 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 their little way. Have their little have their little ga- japes with us. Uh, it's all right. It's you know sometimes you get an electrical storm. Something blows through and the internet goes out. It's all good. Um, but to keep continue this conversation while we work to get him back, the, what a lot of people I think on the Republican, the more sane Republican side, especially in the Senate. The reason why they're so open to having this bipartisan approach to doing it is because they they don't want Kamala Harris in 2024 possibly having this same power, right? What they think, the argument you know, they're using that what Pence should have done, even though we know it's bullshit, they, hello, that means that Kamala Harris would technically have that under their thought process. So they don't right. want to see that. Well, and, and that's that's the thing. They will have this degree of, of intellectual flexibility 
Um, and they'll just say, oh, no, that's not true. She doesn't have that power because she's a woman, by God. Or they'll say, you know, the election was stolen, therefore Mike Pence or, or whoever, whoever Trump's 2024 VP nominee will be. They will make up some brand new legal theory, some brand new, you know, uh, some brand new case that they'll make in their heads um, to try to to try to make it work. Um, I mean, this was pretty creative. I, I give them style points for this listen, one. I listen, mean- it, it was exotic. Yes. It, it, it was it was unusual, <laughs> you know, and, and it and it did it did have a certain amount of it did have a certain amount of 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 flair to it that that you know I think it caught some people off guard. There he is. As well, there he is. There, exactly. there, was, there was some Italian military satellite interference. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to release the Kraken to find out the truth. <laughs> So you Matthew, just track the packets. That's all you have to do is track the packets. Yeah, you know, those Italians. Que cazzo fai, Italia. What was that? <laughs> um, before they interrupted our our uh, our little chat here, we were Come talking about... Come on, election fraud. Right. That's right. How do you say election fraud in Italian? Um, before that interruption, we were talking about why the Electoral Count Act was uh, necessary for reform. Because I, if, if Pence couldn't so, do it, uh, and most legal scholars believe that, why would he fix it? hearing you right now can you hear us matthew uh oh usually it's rick wilson that has these technical problems right because i live in a swamp uh, yes. literally <laughs> <laughs> okay well so it, uh, hopefully i'm back now if i heard your uh, question correct Oh no! This is so important too. The you know what? We level. should get him on the podcast. Yes, we can get him Let's on. Get the him podcast. on the podcast. I, I think got- I think the tech gods are 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 against us tonight, and and it, it happens sometimes, folks. Um, That's okay. Well, here's the thing. Um, I read his risk assessment paper, right? And I encourage everyone to go and check yeah. it out. It's only six pages long, so it's not you know it's not like a dissertation. It's a short essay. It's called a realistic risk assessment of the presidential election of 2024, and he talks about um, different scenarios that could possibly unfold in 2024. But what worries him the most is not necessarily what's going to happen in Congress, but what could happen on the state level. He's worried that a governor from a swing state, let's say Georgia at this point, um, or a secretary of state yep. and from one of these states, they get together and they cook up they, they cook up a kook, kooky idea to say, yeah, we're not going to certify it and send an illegal slate of electors. That is what he's considering the worst case scenario. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. That's what the New York Times was And I think to. all these structures that are being built out in these states, these laws they're passing, almost comprise an attractive nuisance for these people. You know, when you give somebody a tool, they want to use it. That's right. It's open the door. Yes. It's open the door to this because We're going to try to we're going to try to put Matt back in the stream here one more time. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if it works. Nope. Yep. Nope. Yep. <laughs> no. All right. All right. We tried. Oh, Matt, okay. we'll have that's you on the right. podcast, Matt. We'll have yeah, we we'll have him. Absolutely love your stuff. And uh, we'll and, we'll have we'll have him on the podcast where yep. he can go through it even more so. Um, and to finish this conversation, Rick, the other the other part of this, outside of just the legal implications and the the constitutional implications of it, it it further emphasizes why it's so important for Democrats to be paying attention to these state mm-hmm. offices. James Carville, we alluded to this on Tuesday. He said, you guys, get off your asses, pay attention. Right. Republicans already have the jump on you with all of this funding for state for state offices like Secretary of State that w- Democrats are kind of like, wait, what? They're, Republicans are good at this. This is part of their playbook. So for all of you folks who live in these states, particularly in swing states, please, for the love of God, Pay attention to who's right. running for these offices. This stuff is important. It's real, and it's and it's 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 coming at us very quickly. It it is. Um, and there are, you know, I was I was looking at this this uh, this despicable ad today out in Arizona. Um, folks, the Senate is fifty fifty. The Senate control of the Senate is on the line here. Every single senator matters, 
And there's a Senate race out in Arizona with Mark Kelly, who is a former astronaut. Okay, the guy I actually had the chance to see him um, go up in his final final mission as an astronaut, which is really, really cool. But anyway, he's also the husband of Gabby Giffords, who was a congresswoman. And if folks remember about 10 years ago, I think around now, um, she was shot and one of her staffers was killed in this tragic attack, domestic terrorism attack against her by some Looney Tune. And she was paralyzed, but she survived. And they ran this guy that's running against him. I don't even give a shit what his name is. Actually put out a campaign ad where there, it's like an okay corral situation where they shoot Mark Kelly, Nancy Pelosi, and somebody else, some other Democratic opponent. What? This is what you're doing. This is what Ari- this is what Arizona Republicans are putting up for a, a legitimate Senate candidate against a hero. I don't care what you think of his politics, but this guy is an American hero, former astronaut, smart guy, decent senator. Come on. This kind of this this casual uh, allusion to violence as being okay to take out your political enemies is freaking dangerous. We're gonna have more Gabby Gifford situations, or on the other side, like the wackadoo that shot up Republicans at the at the um, congressional softball game practice. Like I, I just don't understand this. Yeah, it. it I, I haven't actually had a chance to see the ad yet, but I've been hearing a lot of a lot of folks talk about it in the last couple of hours, and it's um, you know, read the circumstances, dude. Yeah, uh, it, it, and even it, if it's meant to be, even if it's meant to be tongue in cheek or funny, read the circumstances. Not, it's not. I don't know what's going on out there in Arizona. You got that one and the oh, and the other okay. one running for running for governor. That's a and you've also got cyber ninjas. Yeah, that's right. Cyber ninjas was going on there. You got the that what's her name that's running for um for governor. That, Bolton, um, yeah. Oh my God, that's a QAnon sympathizer. Yeah. It's uh I, no. Come on, come on, Arizona. And, and you've you got, the right the, and you've got QAnon, the QAnon guy, Ron oh, Watkins, that's right. Ron running Watkins. in the primary out there. But apparently, Isn't there's Paul just Gosar not a giant Arizona QAnon too? army out there. He's only raised $32,000 <laughs> for his congressional race. So he's somewhere like 14th in the, fund, in the funding stack in that congressional race. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that, buddy. Um, isn't Gosar from Arizona too? Yes. What is in the water? I love Arizona. Such a beautiful I state. love Arizona. I love Arizona. Anywho, get it together, Arizona. Um, right? Good all Lord. right. So we did have a little technical grumblings tonight. I'm sad about that, but that's okay. We're going to end on, on a, a humorous note. Um, I don't know if people saw Kevin McCarthy was asked some questions to respond to the RNC and their recent decision to condemn Kinzinger and Cheney and say that January 6th was a, well, censure them. And that January 6th was legitimate political discourse. Yeah, I remember that. So he was asked and his reaction to this was, was rather comical. So of course, leave it to the Lincoln Project to come up with an ad for it, which will run digitally in a few places in DC, in Palm Beach, and um, in Bakersfield, California this Sunday. So you get the first look at it. It's called Olympics. As all eyes turn toward America's Winter Olympians competing in Beijing, join us for the lesser known 2022 Winter Coward Olympics taking place in Washington, D.C. Today, multi-medalist D.C. veteran Kevin McCarthy shows us his perfect form in the 1,000 meter downhill moral collapse. That's right, McCarthy, who faces stiff competition from rising stars Jim Jordan and Marjorie Taylor Greene, has trained hard to bow to Donald Trump's big lie. From this... Last week's violent attack on the Capitol was undemocratic, un-American, and criminal. To this... You know what, they did a point in the office. Come on, it's not good, it's not good. <laughs> you just don't see this kind of performance very often. Just look at the flexibility. And you thought the gymnasts were just at the summer games. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I was wrong. It's not in Bakersfield. It's in D.C., which is where McCarthy is this week. So um, it, 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 it is... <laughs> Well, well done. Well, well done. done, team. Yes, shout well out done. to Michelle. And that and was one of the Andrew. ones that came together. At, you know, there was a discussion last night, and and it was by, by this morning we had amazing stuff. Shout out to Michelle 
who is our, our creative director, and to the team who edited and everything else. Yes. Uh, and put this thing together in very short order. And it is the kind of thing that I know will grind Kevin's gears because he thinks of himself as a smart, tough guy. Please. He is neither. Please. Um, so before we go, we wanted to uh, mention some of the banned books because we have a giveaway. And here we go. Project Lincoln, um, some of the banned books, are Beloved, Song of Solomon, uh, those are two of Peggy's favorite books. And then Joe Kurtz, <clears throat> my list of banned books, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Animal Farm, To Kill a Mockingbird, Diary of Anne Frank. Other than Harry Potter, I've read all of those at some point in my life. And the fact that any of those books are uh, possibly banned or that others wouldn't have an opportunity to read those classics, I think is should raise the red flag for a lot of people. Come on, what are we doing? What are we doing? Uh, I love how I love how they, they believe that Harry Potter promotes the practice of witchcraft because <laughs> I, I, it, it is it is one of these things that I just I, I I am stunned by by the by the weird reaches that these people make. But but the, I think you bifurcate these books into two broad categories. There are ideas people don't want to think about racism, anti-Semitism, slavery. They want to pretend those things can be dismissed now. They're in the past or they or they shouldn't upset children. And now we're seeing this emergent area of, of books that offend them, their cultural sensibilities. Yes, which is how and this I, started. I think Potter falls into that as well. But, you know, th this is the kind of thing that that is a real misread of the culture. It is a fundamental misread of the culture. Um, it is. And, and you can't make... I, you know, the, the more you try to push a book down into the darkness in this day and age, the more it's going to come out. Well, the more people we are going to are, are going to seek it out. We mentioned it on Tuesday. Some of those books are now New York Times on the New York Times bestseller list uh, recently. So, it, you know, at least there, the more awareness there is of it, the more we can fight back against it. All right, folks, thank you so much. On Tuesday, we're going to have Jeremy Peters to talk about his yes. new book, Insurgency. And he's got some good tidbits in that, especially about Bannon and January 6th. Um, he's a New York Times reporter. He's, he's coming and will be with us on Tuesday. So make sure you tune in for us on Tuesday. Have a great weekend. We'll see you then. Have a good one, folks.